Chapter 18 of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood. Chapter 18 A Tragic End to our troubles on a certain evening some eight or ten days after that outburst on the part of the finn in connection with his demand for weapons billy remarked to me a propos of nothing in particular as we sat together studying as usual that dutchman is a queer chap and no mistake mr blackburn he will sit for hours saying never a word but billy pass me that or billy take hold of this and then all of a sudden he'll begin to chatter like a parrot really said i and what does he chatter about oh all sorts of things answered billy chiefly about what he and svorenson went through before they joined us here and he likes to hear how we managed too before we settled down on eden do you know i'm beginning to think he's not such a bad sort of chap after all he seems to admire you immensely does he indeed i commented dryly in what particular way does he reveal his admiration well said billy he thinks you are perfectly wonderful every way wonderfully clever as a navigator you know clever to have been able to build the sailing boat still more clever to have designed and very nearly built such a beautiful craft as the cutter and most clever of all to have built this bungalow he said that he could understand that a clever sailor like you might be able to build a boat but he could not understand how any sailor even you could build such a fine house he wanted to know how long it took us to build it and how we set about it whether you invented it as we went on or whether you drew it out on paper beforehand and when i said that you had drawn it all out before we began to build he said that he'd dearly like to see the drawing because it would give him some wrinkles if he should ever again be shipwrecked and what did you say to that i asked well said billy you see i thought it was perhaps his roundabout way of asking me to show him the plan so i said i didn't know where it was that i rather thought you had destroyed it and when i said that the poor chap looked so disappointed that i showed him what it was like by sketching it out on the ground with the point of a sail needle that is very interesting i said here is a paper and pencil just reproduce on it as nearly as you can the sketch you made on the ground the boy took the pencil and paper and in a few minutes completed a rough but quite accurate plan of the bungalow showing the relative positions of the several rooms in the front and rear portions of the house i observed also that he indicated with scrupulous fidelity the position of every window and door showing the possibility of passing from any one room to any other through the passages and the living room this sketch does you credit i said it gives an excellent idea of the general arrangement of the house but i really do not see how the information it affords is in the least degree likely to be of use to van Rijn, even should he be shipwrecked a dozen times over to speak quite frankly i would very much rather that you had not made that sketch on the ground for his information do you think he understood it no confessed billy i don't believe he did for he asked all sorts of silly questions about it that he wouldn't have asked if he had understood the plan ah indeed said i do you happen to remember any of those questions no i don't think i do replied billy they were so awfully stupid that i didn't pay much attention to them i explained that those marks pointing to the drawing represented doors yet the silly ass couldn't understand how the servants got from their room to the kitchen nor how they brought our meals from the kitchen to the living room without going outside and walking round the house and he couldn't understand how you and i got from our rooms to the living room without going outside that's too bad said i it seems to reflect upon your powers of description doesn't it billy it does rather admitted the boy yet i did my best to make him understand but he didn't seem able to grasp that we were supposed to be looking down upon the bungalow with the roof off 
he persisted in thinking that we were looking square at it and that the rooms in the rear were above those in the front of the house stupid fellow i commented and was the house the only thing he manifested curiosity about oh no answered billy there were lots of other things he asked about he wanted to know where we got kit from and how it is that he is so tame with us and so savage with everybody else he asked if we weren't afraid that some day he would turn upon us and do us an injury he said that if he was boss he'd shoot the beast right away and he grumbled a bit because you wouldn't give him and Swarinson any firearms to defend themselves with not only from the leopard but also from the natives whom he said he didn't trust a little bit and who might come across any night and massacre us all in our sleep then he wanted to know how we were going to get the cutter into the water when she is ready for launching and then let me see oh yes we got on about the natives again and the apes he said it was all very well for us who could bolt ourselves securely in the house at night but what about him and Swarinson if an ape should come across and surprise them in their tent some night how were they to defend themselves without weapons of any kind i laughed at that and told him that there was so little likelihood of anything of that sort happening that we never closed our doors or windows except when it rained but he said that didn't matter we could defend ourselves if such a thing happened because we had plenty of arms and they ought to have some too he said that what with the leopard the apes and the savages life was none too safe for unarmed men like him and the finn did his terror seem quite real or do you think it was all exaggerated i asked oh no asserted billy with conviction it was real enough and it wasn't exaggerated either he was in a regular funk you see he and Swarinson had a pretty bad time one way and another all the time they were on west island but it was the apes that frightened them worst of all yes i agreed i can quite understand that but as an idea suggested itself to me do you think van ryn suspects that you repeat these conversations of his to me no i don't think so answered the boy why should he i don't believe such a thought ever enters his head i did not feel by any means so sure of that as billy seemed to be if the man suspected that his remarks and questionings were repeated to me his assumption of extreme stupidity might be explained as designed to disarm any suspicion aroused in my mind by the queer character of some of his questions take those relating to the arrangement of the house for example the pretense that the information would be valuable to him should he ever again be cast away was altogether too puerile for consideration he required the information and very cleverly extracted it from the unsuspecting billy too for some entirely different reason but what was that reason i wondered i was not long kept wondering the second night after the above recorded conversation between billy and myself brought with it the threat of a change of weather it had been exceptionally hot all day and less wind than usual and there was a languorous quality in the atmosphere that seemed to portend thunder a portent that was strengthened toward nightfall when the wind died away to the merest zephyr while a great bank of heavy lowering cloud piled itself up slowly along the eastern horizon so that the rising full moon had no chance to show herself as the evening progressed what little air of wind there was died completely away and we were left with all doors and windows flung wide open gasping for breath and sweltering as in a turkish bath i endured it as long as i could and then tossing aside the book i was attempting to read announced my determination to go down to the cove and have a swim billy declared that he would like a swim too if he could take a header off the veranda into deep water but as to walking down to the cove in that heat no much as he would enjoy a dip he wasn't prepared to undergo that amount of exertion to get it as the gathering storm seemed unlikely to break suddenly i did not unduly hurry over my dip but remained in the water about an hour emerging at last delightfully cool and quite ready for bed upon my return to the house i found billy still up and poring over a book but he confessed to feeling sleepy 
upon which I ordered the boy off to bed forthwith and, extinguishing the lamp in the living room, retired to my own apartment and straightway turned in, being quickly lulled to sleep by the sound of pouring rain that began just as I stretched myself upon my bed. It seemed as though I had only just fallen asleep when I awoke with startling suddenness. The rain was pelting down on the roof in torrents, making quite noise enough to account for my sudden awakening, through which I could just hear poor Kit whining and fidgeting restlessly under the veranda, outside my French window. Imagining that it was these combined sounds that had awakened me, I rose, thinking, I must fetch that animal indoors. I expect the poor beggar is getting pretty wet, hence his restlessness. One of the doors of my room opened into the living room, while the other gave on to the veranda, both of them being wide open. As I passed through the latter, a vivid flash of lightning revealed the rain coming straight down in sheets and rebounding in glittering spray off the already streaming earth, with Kit straining at his leash, which Billy had made fast as usual to one of the veranda posts. The beast had withdrawn himself as far under the veranda as his leash would permit, and he did not appear to be very wet but he seemed anxious to enjoy the more complete shelter of the living room, so I stepped out and cast him adrift. To my amazement, the instant that I released him from his leash, he tore himself away from my hold upon his collar and, with a savage snarl, bounded through the living room door. The next instant there issued, from the interior of the room, a yell of consternation, immediately followed by a shriek of terror, the fall of a heavy body on the floor, screams execrations and the dreadful sound of kit worrying somebody or something and before i could draw another breath the figure of a yelling screaming frantic man dashed from the room cleared the veranda steps at a bound landed heavily on the ground some five feet below and still screaming disappeared through the curtain of pouring rain but the sounds from the living room still continued with increasing violence augmented now by cries from billy whose form I dimly descried outlined against the dark background of the open door, and a perception of what had happened, and was still happening, leapt to my brain with sudden enlightenment. "'Bring a light, Billy! Quick!' I shouted as I sprang through into the living room and, instinctively avoiding the table that stood in the middle of the room, flung myself upon the struggling group on the floor. My hands at once came into contact with Kit's hairy hide, and slid along it until they closed upon the collar round his neck. When, exerting all my strength, I dragged the beast, still savagely snarling and resisting, off the writhing and groaning form at my feet. Somehow, to this day I know not how, I managed to drag the fiercely struggling creature out of the room and back to the veranda, where I securely tied him up again. Then I returned to the living room as Billy entered it with a lighted lamp. I took the lamp from him and said, Light the lamp in my room, boy, and then lend me a hand to put this man on my bed. I next turned to the writhing, groaning figure on the floor and saw that, as I had already surmised, it was that of Svorenson. He was dressed only in shirt and trousers, both of which, rain sodden and drenched with blood, were torn to rags by the teeth and claws of the leopard which was still raving outside and doing his utmost to break adrift from his moorings. The man's injuries, especially about the throat, shoulders, arms, and chest, were shocking, and I felt that, with the limited appliances at our command, there was but very small hope of saving his life. He still grasped in his right hand a formidable bludgeon, and a similar weapon lay on the floor near him, I had only time to take in these details when Billy returned, and between us we contrived to half carry, half drag the writhing and groaning Finn into my room and deposit him on my bed. I then sent Billy to the native's room, the occupants of which had been roused by the disturbance, bidding him set them to work providing warm water and such other matters as I thought I might require. Guided by the book of instructions attached to the medicine chest, I did the best I could for the injured man, but his wounds were of so ghastly a nature and his suffering so acute that I recognized from the very outset not only that it was impossible he should recover, but that death must ensue in a very few hours. 
and it was dreadful to sit there by his side listening to his moans liberally interspersed with curses of the leopard of me and not infrequently of mankind in general and to reflect that that flood of blasphemy was issuing from the lips of a man hovering on the brink of eternity at length i could endure it no longer and i said to him rather sharply i am afraid stop that blasphemy swarenson for pity's sake and rather turn your thoughts to prayer if you know how to pray i fear that your life has been a deplorably misspent one and it can last but a few hours longer before tomorrow's sun sets you will be face to face with god therefore i urge you to devote the few remaining hours at your disposal to making your peace with him instead of cursing those who have never knowingly wronged you what do you mean he gaspingly demanded i ain't gone to die am i yes i said you are and it is well that you should know it therefore forget all your wrongs real or imaginary and but here i was interrupted by an outburst of such vile and savage profanity that it literally rendered me speechless it lasted i suppose fully ten minutes and left its utterer gasping and in a state of collapse i administered stimulant and at length the color came slowly back to the sufferer's cheeks and lips and he opened his eyes for several minutes he lay there gazing up at me steadfastly questioningly then he muttered thank ye mister if it hadn't been for you i'd have slipped my cable that time and so you think i'm going to die well i'm beginning to think so myself now my god it's awful to think that a few hours more and i shall be face to face with my maker and being called to account for a whole lifetime of wickedness and there's no way out oh but there is i said eagerly and thereupon i began to expound with all the earnestness at my command and as lucidly as i could the wonderful story of man's redemption i got my bible and read passage after passage suited to the dying man's needs until the expression of terror and anxiety gradually faded from his features and ultimately his eyes closed and he seemed to fall asleep then the day dawned and billy entering softly took my place as watcher while i snatched a brief hour or two of sleep on his bed i was aroused by the clatter of crockery in the living room where the native women were making ready to serve breakfast for even when the shadow of death hovers over a house its inmates must needs eat and drink and then one of the natives who every day came over to help with the work on the cutter brought the news that the sailing boat had disappeared the inference being that van rhine had taken her nevertheless i gave orders that eden should be thoroughly searched for him but he was never found nor was the boat and that was the end of him so far as we were concerned for we never again heard of him when breakfast was ready i tiptoed to the door of my bedroom and beckoned billy who crept softly out closing the door behind him he is asleep again now the boy whispered but he is dying in peace and he wants to see you mr blackburn before he passes away that he may repeat to you the terrible confession that he has made to me we took breakfast in silence for our minds were full of thoughts too deep for utterance and when we had finished i resumed my post beside the dying man's bed Svorenson was still asleep the sleep of utter exhaustion but he was very uneasy and moaning occasionally about half an hour later however he awoke and after i had again given him a stimulant he stammered and gasped the confession he desired to make there is no need to repeat it here word for word in substance it was to the effect that van rhine had proposed and he had agreed that they too obtaining entry through the back of the house should murder me in my sleep if possible arm themselves from the arms chest and thereafter impose their will upon poor billy the cutter was to be completed and launched the treasure shipped aboard her and the conspirators with billy as forced navigator were to make their way to some civilized port arrived in sight of which billy was to be knocked on the head and hove overboard exactly as i had suspected while the two men were to divide the treasure equally between them 
it was a dreadful confession for a man to make and i found it bitterly hard to utter the words of forgiveness that were so piteously pleaded for but i forced myself to do so at last and shortly after noon of that day the man happy now and i believe at peace with his maker passed away we buried his body an hour or two later with the death of one and the disappearance of the other of the two men who had come into our lives only to act as a disturbing element from almost the first moment of our acquaintance with them all my worries and anxieties passed away like the memory of an evil dream and upon the day following that of Swaronson's death i turned with renewed zest to the completion of the cutter the hull was by this time practically finished her deck was laid her companion and tiny self-emptying cockpit completed and all that was now needed was to run a low bulwark around her rig and step the completed mast and bowsprit bend the sails ballast and launch her get the stores water and treasure aboard and up anchor and away taken as it stands that list of work still remaining to be done looks simple enough yet it took me a full month to complete it for the greater part of it was of so technical a character that the natives were of little assistance to me and i had to do most of it with my own hands also i found that van Rijn had by no means completed the task he had undertaken to perform the two topsails square header and jib header still needed roping as did the jib and that work cost me several days labor to complete to my satisfaction then there were the launching ways and the cradle to be built and this task taxed my ingenuity to its utmost limit but at length all was done except the actual launching of the boat the finishing touches to my final preparations were completed too late in the afternoon for us to do anything more that day immediately after breakfast on the following morning therefore billy and i climbed aboard the cutter hoisted the yorkshire lasses ensign to her top masthead suspended a bottle of wine one of the very few that we had left from her stem head and then leaving billy aboard i descended to the ground removing the ladder by which we had ascended the wedging up having already been accomplished i next took a maul and shouting to billy to stand by proceeded to knock away the spur shores there was now a moment's hesitation on the part of the cutter of which i took advantage to jump clear and then she began to move slowly at first but with rapidly increasing velocity while i dashed the bottle of wine against the craft's cut water and named her the dolphin in accordance with billy's earnestly expressed wish two seconds later the craft took the water plunging deeply with the foam brimming to her taffrail then rising buoyantly she shot far out toward the middle of the cove until in obedience to my hail billy let go her anchor and brought her up i then saw that i had underestimated the amount of ballast required and that she needed about half a ton more and a slight readjustment of it to put her in correct trim that however was an error that could be easily rectified and meanwhile i was highly gratified by the graceful appearance she presented now that she was afloat next in order came a cold collation that i had caused to be prepared for the delectation of boata and his petty chiefs the whole of whom i had invited over to eden to witness the launch and billy having been brought ashore in the islander's boat we forthwith fell to all hands doing full justice to the feast at its conclusion i formally presented the bungalow and all that we were leaving in it to Bawata, with a strict injunction to him and his to show the utmost kindness to any shipwrecked persons who might hereafter be so unfortunate as to be cast away on the group an injunction which they all promised to obey most faithfully then followed our mutual farewells to the accompaniment of much howling and weeping on the part of our black friends after which the remainder of the day was devoted to the completion of the ballasting of the cutter and its correct adjustment there was but one other duty now to be done before we started for home and that was the disposal of kit the leopard 
since the night when he so fearfully mauled Svorenson, the nature of the beast had undergone a material change for the worse he had developed an uncertainty and ferocity of temper that rendered him distinctly unsafe and altogether unsuitable as a pet for any one with grief and many tears poor billy was obliged to admit that such was the case therefore it was at length agreed that he should be transported to west island where he could hurt no one and where he would find ample prey for his sustenance accordingly on the following morning we weighed anchor and bade a final good-bye to our pacific eden sailing through the east and north island channels to west island where without mishap we landed kit and turned him adrift to shift for himself not by any means without regret for the beast had stood us in good stead on one memorable occasion then sailing up northwest channel we entered the lagoon and heading to the northward passed through the wide gap in the reef abreast of shark bay and once more found ourselves riding buoyantly on the long swell of the open pacific of course i had long ago given most careful consideration to the question of where i should steer for in the event of the cutter's completion and after much study of the charts at my command i had decided to shape a course for sydney australia it meant a voyage of some two thousand three hundred and fifty miles across the open ocean in a ten-ton cutter but i felt sure the dolphin could do it especially as we should have the southeast trade wind and the prospect of reasonably fine weather with us nearly all the way accordingly as soon as we were fairly clear of the reef i bore up and headed away to the southward along the west side of the group of which we finally lost sight about an hour before sunset to say that our voyage was unadventurous would be untrue on the contrary we had many thrilling adventures and several hairbreadth escapes from destruction but lack of space forbids more than the bare mention of them here let it suffice to say that after a voyage packed with sufficiently exciting incidents we arrived safely in sydney harbour on the twenty-third day after our departure from the group arrived there my first business was to negotiate with a firm of bankers for the exchange of some of the gold coinage which formed part of our treasure for a sufficient number of british sovereigns to carry both of us comfortably home and this done we set about providing ourselves with outfits suitable for the voyage it was of course impossible for us to keep our adventures entirely secret a hint of them somehow got abroad possibly from the people in the hotel at which we put up and the enterprising reporters of the sydney papers did the rest one result of which was that i soon got from a local yachtsman so advantageous an offer for the dolphin that i unhesitatingly accepted it we spent a very pleasant fortnight in sydney many of its leading citizens vying with each other to show us hospitality finally on a certain day in the month of april we both embarked for england in an orient liner which after a most delightful voyage landed us in london on a glorious day in the month of may end of chapter eighteen recording by warren cotty gurney illinois End of The Strange Adventures of Eric Blackburn by Harry Collingwood